I was he was very, very clever, very, very talented vocally. And for a long time, they were looking for someone to do poo. It turned out that, uh, well, I worked with Hal on a couple of, I, you know, I did all of the poo movies. And Hal was the owl originally. Uh, I don't know who took over afterwards, but Hal was the owl. And uh, we worked together quite a bit. But it was a very, a very big surprise when Hal came up with the pool voice. <laughs> and he was right on. He was right on. As for my way of thinking, uh, not that I'm putting anybody down, but I think he was even better than the guy they got now. Yeah. Jim Cummings, who does a very nice job, but uh, Hal was just, just great. Yeah, he probably studied Sterling Holloway. Oh yeah, and then Hal and I worked together on the Smurfs. You did? Yeah, Hal was one of the, came in quite frequently as one of the Smurfs. Yeah, and uh, June Foray was in there too. Oh yeah, June was in it, and uh, well, Hal, you know, Hal was like like with us old timers. He was way back with when Don Messick was around and Dawes Butler was around, and even Paul Freeze. I don't know if you remember those names. Oh, pa Paul Freeze, I was told, was the king of uh, voiceovers. Oh, Paul Freeze. Wow. He used to sit in the back of his limo as a chauffeur, and he'd drive from date to date, looking at the script. What am I going to do on this next gig? Oh yeah, he was quite quite some guy. Yeah, well, but he wasn't as homey and as warm as Hal. Yeah, Hal was really jolly all the time. Yeah, Paul was Paul was a nice guy, but he was kind of impressed with himself. Well, he, he was doing very well, so I guess uh, there are a lot of people who, when they do very well, kind of lose a little equilibrium. Uh -huh. uh, when did you first go to Hollywood? Well, I actually went out to California in 1938. Wow. Yeah. I was a kid going to school in New York City, and I was studying commercial art. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be an artist. I had dreams. I'm going to go to Paris, live in a garret, and study the Impressionists and learn how to paint and blah, blah, blah. And I went to a school called the School of Industrial Arts in Manhattan. Just about at that time, Edgar Bergen hit the scene. Yeah. Rudy Valley presented him on his show, The Valley Show, and the rest was history. He became absolutely a rage, which was astounding because of ventriloquist. You figure somebody you have to see, and here he is just vocally on the radio and became an absolute sensation. Well, I, I listened to him and I enjoyed him, but I never had any aspirations because I didn't know what a ventriloquist was. I thought it was just a guy. They told me he does all the voices, so I figured, well, it's a guy changing his voice. It didn't impress me until the first movie came out. It was The Goldwyn Follies of 1934, I think, or five. Not quite sure of the date, but I know it was the Goldwyn Follies. Uh, one of the female stars was Andrea Leeds. I mean, my memory is so sharp because it was so important to me to go to the theater and to take a look. That's where I had enjoyed him so much on radio. Well, I went to the theater and I sat down. I had no idea what I was going to see. And all of a sudden, I saw this guy with a dummy. And I was absolutely fascinated. I remember the scene so well. Charlie was lying down. And all of a sudden, Bergen sat him up. And that was the first glimpse I had of the fact he was a dummy. I didn't know what ventriloquism was. I didn't know that Bergen was doing it until I actually saw the movie. Then I put two and two together. Because as talented as he was, he wasn't the greatest turtle lip movement, you know, the lip control of the ventriloquist. So I could I could see plainly that he was the one doing the talking, but the illusion was so overpowering to me that I made up my mind right then and there that I wanted to try it. Well, at that time he was very popular and 
he had written a little booklet. It wasn't really a book. It was a booklet on how to be a ventriloquist. And at that time, it only cost a dime. So I sent away a dime, and I got the booklet. As a matter of fact, it's so funny, I have the booklet. Right here, it's on my desk. <laughs> Same damn booklet. Have you gone on my website? Yes, I have. Oh, no, I, no, it's not on the website. I just, I just wrote, uh, I rewrote a book that was a big, big seller back in the 50s. It was called Ventriloquism for Fun and Profit. And I got so many requests lately to reissue the book. So I sat down and I rewrote the whole thing containing all of the tricks and the things that I have learned since then to make it much easier for a kid. And I opened the book with a photograph of that little booklet. That's in the book. That, that should be published soon. Okay. And uh, that's a picture of Bergen that inspired me. And uh, I got that booklet. I began to study it, do everything it told me to do. And uh, where children who are interested, like I was, might think that this is a very difficult thing to learn because so many ventriloquists have given the impression that you have to be born with a certain free construction of the vocal cords and a lot of the the, the, blue, you know, the blah blah stuff that really is not accurate. So I began to study it and three months later, it was only three months later, I appeared on the Major Bowes Original Amateur Hour on CBS Radio 1938, and that was a show you probably aren't familiar with, but Major Bowes, pardon me? Started on that. Yes, he was on a few weeks before me. Major Bowes had a presented amateur, completely amateur performance. He was the first guy to get the gong. If you weren't any good, and the audience in the studio got kind of restless, bong, you get the gong. And he'd say, all right, all right, all right. And you had it. So I appeared on the show. The way I got on the show is after I had learned to do ventriloquism, I came to school. And I was studying, along with some of my other subjects, I was studying sculpturing and painting and puppetry and a number of different allied things. And I asked my teacher if I would get credit if I built a ventriloquist figure, would that qualify for credit? He says, well, of course, that this is an art school. It requires sculpturing, it requires casting, it requires molding, it requires all of the things that we're studying. Yes, and he was kind enough, he helped me along the way, and I built the first ventriloquist dummy in that class. I didn't know anything about the mechanics kind of Mickey Mouse the whole thing, which was very startling to me when I first saw the first professional ventriloquist figure. I was right on. Even though I Mickey Mouse it, it's just about what, what, they, what, they, what they consist of. Uh, then I began to entertain the kids in class. And my teacher was very proud. He sent me around from classroom to classroom. And finally, the principal got word of it when he called me to his office. He said, let me see what you've learned. I hear so much about uh, 